that is an anomaly. I mean, what most journalists wind up doing in their career is not winding, is not being on CNN, is not being at ESPN. Yeah. It is a working yeah. class profession. And my fear and my concern is that because of what you need to be able to financially weather to stay a journalist, that automatically becomes a major roadblock for mm-hmm. people of color, for Black people in particular. Welcome to On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I am, of course, Donnie Deutsch. Otherwise, the show would not be called On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. And this is a show dedicated to a simple premise that everybody's a brand today. Everything is a brand today. Every product, every corporation, every celebrity, every athlete, every politician. Uh, look, if you got a Facebook page, you're a brand. And we do two things on the show. show. We do a big interview with a, with a big person about their brand. And today is Jamel Hill, uh, writer for The Atlantic, uh, years and years and years at ESPN. She uh, uh, left ESPN in a, kind of a little bit of a controversy at the end because she speaks her mind and uh, it was too political for them. But she's got a lot to say, uh, a riveting conversation, and I think you're going to really, really enjoy it. But we also do something called Brands of the Week. where We review which brands are up, which ones are down, which ones are driving the zeitgeist, and let's get right into Brands of the Week. First Brand of the Week is... Uh, uh, President Zelensky uh, from Ukraine, you know, he's, he, he they had a tape message of him at the at the um, Grammys, and the guy just understands media, understands he, he just the way he, he talked about music and the difference between music and what's going on there, and and our freedom, and he just is a, is a master master communicator. You know, he's got his brand with his with his green T shirt. And the way he speaks and understanding how to use the megaphone out there and use the megaphone of the Grammys. And it's just uh, what's going on in Ukraine is just is unthinkable. Uh, Putin is a butcher. Uh, I'm not even going to do a brand thing on butcher who speaks for himself. He's a war criminal. Uh, Biden's calling it as it is. Uh, and it's genocide. And if it shows one thing, it's just throughout, although we've advanced the civilization throughout time, they're barbarians. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's painful to watch. Brand down, surprisingly, for, for Joe Biden. Uh, he, and here's why. What's interesting is none of the good stuff is sticking to him. You know, the economy, yes, we've got inflation, but wages are up 5.6%. Employment is going from 6.1% to 3.6%. Uh, there's continued job creation. Uh, yet, none of it sticks. If you ask both Republicans and Democrats in a poll and say, are we losing jobs or gaining jobs? More Americans think we're losing jobs. Um, and on the flip side, uh, if you ask Americans, has he done a good job with Ukraine? Only 36% yes, say yes. Yet, um, he's done as good a job as he's going to be, with, you know, holding this alliance together with tough sanctions. There's nothing he could do any differently. And so the message is not working. For some reason, the good stuff doesn't stick, so his brand gets a brand down. Brand up for Texas A&M, offering Ukrainian students full tuition, room and board, um, it's great. They, they said they authorized funds to pay up to $25,000 to Ukrainian students, tuition fees and limited living expenses. Uh, so you got to give it to Texas A&M. Let's get them a brand up. Uh, brand down for, and this goes back to Putin. Uh, I'm sorry, this goes, uh, it is Putin, but it goes back to Biden also. That Biden, they've been trying to position inflation as the Putin tax hike, uh, the Putin's price hike. Uh, I'm sorry, Putin's price hike. Donnie, get with it. And the American people are not buying it. They know there was inflation before this was going on. And they understand that, yes, it's affected gas prices, but the Putin price hike, which they're calling, the Democrats are trying to sell, is not the, is not the reason for inflation. Yes, it's inflating gas prices, but, but certainly that's a very, very small part of what's going on. Brand down for Donald Trump. Um, it, all you need to about Donald Trump is they had, they had a gridiron dinner this past weekend. Um, and it's where... The governor, the uh, uh, governor of the state of New Hampshire, who's got a seventy percent approval rate, and Chris Sununu, got up and said, he literally said, he said Trump's fucking crazy, and he said, I'm not saying he belongs in a mental institution, but if he ever went into one, he probably wouldn't come out. And you know, for a Republican governor with a seventy five percent approval rating to be saying things like that, it just shows people are not running running as scared of Donald Trump anymore. That they're not. And his Trump social network, which was his first enterprise since being a president, has been an abjunct failure. Uh, the stock is already down 40%. People invested in it. Um, and uh, we're going to see continue to see his brand sink. I have, I have no doubt about that. And that's coming off of a week of finding out about the six, seven hour missing phone calls uh, and ever losing every legal battle. And I think you're going to start to see him his brand continue to decay. 
brand, I don't know, for Sarah Palin. She announced her run for Congress. Uh, I, I don't think people want to look backwards. We'll see. I think her brand is too tarnished, but we're going to do a brand TBD because we don't know. Uh, brand up, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. He said, we have to have electable nominees. How do you feel about a former President Trump is irrelevant. There are ways of measuring a credible candidate, and that's what I want. This is not an ideological litmus test for how you feel about the former president. It's can you win in November? And he's speaking it like it is. I never, I would never thought I'd be giving brand ups to him, but uh, you, you got to do it. You got to do it. Brand down, it, 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 it's last week, but I, I, I got to get into it. Ginny Thomas, uh, the wife of, of course, Clarence Thomas, who they found was communicating with Mark Meadows the during the uh, after January after January six, and said, "Help the great president stand firm, Mark." Thomas wrote to Meadows in the days following, oh, it was following the election, I'm sorry. Her derangement and despair wrought in a bonanza of exclamation points. You are the leader with him who is standing America's constitutional governance at the precipice. Uh, you know, this is, she's, she, they are best friends, her and Clarence Thomas, but in addition to being married. And this is what she is saying to the president's chief of staff. And you just wonder how, how much of this is getting back to Clarence Thomas. And does he have to recuse himself from any if anything gets to the Supreme Court having to do with Trump or having to do with January 6th or anything like that. So I don't know. Brand now for Disney. Uh, you know, Disney's gotten caught in the political uh, crossfire on, on several levels. When they came out with the Don't Say Gay uh, legislation in Florida, Disney didn't come out to condemn it. And they're supposed to be a very progressive organization. They got a lot of heat for that. And eventually they came out and they condemned it. The, the CEO did. And then a few days later, uh, the, head, the head of content of Disney said that 50% of uh, Disney characters going forward are going to be either LGBTQ or minorities. And the right and the center got up in there. And so Disney is just kind of, all of a sudden, is this political ro lightning rod, and they're going to have to answer to everything that goes forward. And, you know, there's a gray areas. You know, it's interesting. The, the, the don't say gay thing um, obviously uh, is wrong, but then if somebody says, I don't know, do I want from kindergarten to third grade any sexual orientation talked about? I mean, there's arguments. Uh, I, I still just think it, it's horrible. Uh, but that that's where we are. Um, and also on the flip side, of just mandating 50% LGBTQ and minorities as Disney characters. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, it's progress, but I understand how some people can react uh, adversely. Brand up for... Caitlyn Jenner, Fox News has hired Caitlyn Jenner as a contributor, which I find ironic being that they're so anti-progressiveness when it comes to LGBTQ. And here they are hiring um, a transgender person. Uh, interesting. I'm not quite sure what, what she's going to be doing on Fox, but that's what they're doing. Uh, brand up for ad agencies. Ad agency employment hits an all-time high. U.S. ad agency enrollment has reached an all-time high uh, advertising, public relations, related service rose by 3,200 jobs in March. The March gain of 3,200 jobs follows an increase of 12,000 jobs in February. So more people going into advertising. It just shows that advertising and marketing and public relations are, are even bigger and bigger part of, of the commerce universe. So that's interesting. Brand, it's really sad about teachers. Uh, teachers in America were already facing collapse. COVID only made it worse. Uh, over half a million public school educators left the field during the pandemic. A recent National Education Association poll of its membership showed that 55% of them were planning to leave. 49% uh, of teachers in an American Psychological Association poll conducted between June, July 20th, July 2020 and June 2021 said they wanted to plan to quit, as well as a large percentage of school staff and administrators. Um, rising costs of living were already outstripping teachers' salaries before the pandemic. Uh, we, we, we don't cherish our teachers enough. Teachers should be paid dramatically more than they're paid. And uh, something's got to be done because if we don't have the right teachers, we don't have the right future. Said, brand down for teenagers' mental health. The CDC warns a steep decline in teen mental health. The accelerating mental health crisis among adolescents with more than four in 10 teens reporting that they feel persistently sad or hopeless. And one in five saying they've contemplated suicide. That's, that's frightening. That's really, really frightening. And... Uh, uh, so to me, it's all social media. It's all social media. You know, I see it with my kids and everybody's seeing everybody else's uh, idealized life, curated life, and why isn't my life like that? And everybody's perfect and everybody's beautiful. Uh, and social media is the devil.
It really, really is. I really believe that. Brand up, got to go for Coach K. Uh, you know, Mike Krzyzewski, the coach of Duke, retiring after 42 years of coaching. I think 40 of them at Duke. The ultimate winner. Five national championships, 17 Final Fours. Um, the most class act you can be in the world of sports. You know, there's never been a blemish on him. There's never been a blemish on a Duke player. Ran such a clean program. And uh, to me, w- one of the most impressive public figures in, in my lifetime is Mike Krzyzewski. Brand out from Major League Baseball. Uh, we're obviously there. We're just starting the season. But pre-COVID, they had gone from 78 million to 68 million people visiting ballparks over a certain period of time over the last number of years. I, I can't remember the, the, whether it was five or six years. And the problem is the game is three hours long uh, is one thing. But I think their bigger problem is that they don't have what I call a star system. If you look at the NBA, if you look at NFL, they've got stars. They've got LeBron. They've got Curry. They've got Tom Brady. They, they've, they've got Aaron Rodgers. We're the four probably best baseball players, Mike Trout, Fernando Tatis Jr., Vlad Guerrero Jr. and Ronald Acuna Jr., a lot of juniors. These are not faces that are out there and they need ambassadors. I'm not saying these are not great guys and they're certainly great players, but you need to market the players, not the sport, and they're getting that wrong. Brand up for Jim Carrey. Uh, first of all, he came out and called Hollywood spineless after they gave a uh, standing ovation to uh, uh, Will Smith after his slap, which I was watching at home, I was cringing. And I also love that he said he's probably retiring because he says, he says, you won't hear this from a lot of celebrities, but well, you will never hear from a celebrity, but he says, I've done a lot, I've had, I've, I've done enough, I've had enough, and I am enough. And somebody who can walk away in their prime, you know, kudos to him. Brand, I, 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 it's old news, obviously, but it's still in the news. Huge brand down for Will Smith in that what you're starting to see happen now are, is the collateral damage. Uh, Netflix has pulled back on a project. Uh, Sony's pulling back on a project. And you know what's interesting? What's in development is a remake of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles with him and Kevin Hart. Picture watching that now, and which is such a funny kind of silly movie, and being able to laugh at Will Smith. I think that's hard to do. And I, you know, I don't know what he does to repair himself. Clearly, he needs to do an interview. There's got to be, it's got to be tear felt. It's got to be genuine. Uh, donate a ton of money to anti-violence charities, but he showed who he is, and that's the problem. You know that 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 took. There has to be such a sense of hubris, such a sense of entitlement, such a uh, sense of just being a complete asshole to do that. And I don't know how he repairs from that. Brand up for Ikea. They will pay you to get its, your old furniture back. Customers can trade in gently used Ikea products in excellent condition and get a store credit worth up to 50% of the original sale price. I think that's fantastic. Brand up for Reebok. Reebok is doing a uh, joint venture with the Flintstones and the Jetsons. You got to love that. Flintstones and the Jetsons are reuniting the nostalgic Reebok sneaker drop. So you can get either the Jetsons or the Flintstones on your Reeboks. I'm in on that. And finally, Pop-Tarts, huge brand up. There was a class action suit against them uh, that basically said that they were misleading when they're labeled, talking about their strawberries. The judge threw it out and said, look, I don't think consumers are purchasing a a, uh, toasted pastry with frosting on top for its nutritional value. So frivolous lawsuit, they threw it out. And those are our brands of the week. Let's get to our interview with Jamel Hill. Um, she is one of the most interesting voices in media today. For years and years and years, she was at ESPN. Got some got political and ESPN said, we don't do politics, which is ridiculous. She speaks her mind. She's got a great writer for The Atlantic. Um, she's got a pulse on what's going on in the world today. And here's my interview. I want to talk to you about Indeed. Look, I ran a company for years. The most important thing is the hiring, is who you hire. If you're hiring, you need Indeed, because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applicants that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner to help you do it all. Indeed partners you on every step of the hiring process, Find great talent and time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. Uh, With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description. You can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. Uh, According to Comscore, Indeed is the number one job site worldwide. More than 3 million businesses worldwide use Indeed. They deliver four times more hires than all of the job sites combined. 
Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job posters indeed at indeed.com slash on brand. Offer valid through April 30th. Go to indeed.com slash on brand to claim your $75 credit before April 30th. Indeed.com slash on brand. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire, you need indeed. All right, I want to talk to you about Chime. That's Chime, C H I M E. This one, really listen to this one, it's important. No one likes waiting for their paycheck, especially when you've got bills and everybody's in that position. Good thing there's Chime. Now you can get your paycheck up to two days early with direct deposit. That's up to two more days to save, pay bills, and generally just feel good about your money situation. But Chime is more than just about getting paid early. It's also an award-winning mobile app, checking account, debit card, and optional savings account. But the huge benefit is you get paid two days early. I mean, you, the, why not use Chime? So what, what are you waiting for? Hopefully not your paycheck. Get started with Chime today. Applying for a free account takes less than two minutes. Get started at chime.com slash Donnie. That's chime.com slash Donnie. Check it out. It, it just, it's just, it's, it's a helper, man. Two days. Who doesn't want two days early paycheck? Banking services and debit card provided by the Bank Corp or Stride Bank, NA, members FDIC. Early access to direct deposit funds depends on pay. I'm really excited today's guest, uh, Jamel Hill. Uh, I've been a big fan for a long, I don't want to say years because I don't want to age her. Uh, she's one of the most outspoken voices in sports and media and pop culture, particularly for issues also involving women of color. Uh, she was sent years at ESPN, uh, made a big mark over there. Um, she's got a podcast on Spotify called Unbothered, a new show on CNN Plus coming. I want to ask her about that, about Carrie and Jamil. Uh, and Jamel's uh, Speak Easy to, to launch soon. Um, she's a staff writer for The Atlantic. She's got a new documentary that she's working on uh, with Spike Lee uh, on Colin Kaepernick. And uh, Jamel, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me, Donnie. I appreciate it. So you sound pretty busy. Yeah, I was like, wow, that really does seem like a lot of jobs. It is a lot of jobs, <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. But, um, you know, I'm happy to be able to be at a space in my career where I can't have my hands in multiple uh, pots. And the great thing about it is that everything kind of uh, is tied together. Everything syncs together. Um, it's still very much in the wheelhouse of what I've been trained to do. I'm a journalist by trade. So telling stories is something that I love to do. And of course, I love, you know, reporting and all those other things. So all of this just ties together. And I, I appreciate that. I love your beginnings as a journalist, uh, how basically you, you grew up and you had, you, you had a tough upbringing to uh, uh, drug addicted parents and your mom was cleaning houses to kind of help him meet and you didn't have any subscriptions to any Detroit uh, newspapers. And that's why you went with your mom to somebody who did and that's the way you kind of started learning sports and reading and, 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 and becoming a journalist. What, it's an incredible story. Uh, well, thank you. And you know, I was always the neighborhood tomboy. So I love to play sports and this was back during the time, uh, the kids don't know about this now, uh, Donnie, where you had to actually read the newspaper to keep up with your sports teams. Yeah. And yeah. because we uh, didn't necessarily um, have money for a newspaper subscription with my mother, she cleaned the house of this elderly white guy, um, Mr. Miller, and he got subscriptions to both newspapers. So whenever she cleaned his house, uh, I would just read the newspaper to occupy the time while she was cleaning the house. So that's how I developed a love for newspapers and particularly for the sports section, because that was pretty much what I read, the sports section and the comics, of course. <laughs> and uh, so it got, it got, it planted a seed without me knowing a seed was being planted. And so when I got to high school, uh, my sophomore year, I think it was, I took a high school journalism class and I've been hooked ever since. I was astounded in, in doing my research that when you were at the Orlando Sentinel in 2006, you were the only woman of color, black writer, journalist in the country. This is not 100 years ago. This is 16 years ago. That, that, yeah. that, that just blew me away. Yeah, to be, I guess to be more um, specific, I was the only black female sports columnist at a daily newspaper in North okay. America. So okay. I was, <laughs> notice I didn't just say America. I said North America. <laughs> North America. Right? So I, I was one out of 405 daily newspapers. I was the only one. And that was honestly embarrassing. Not for me. It was embarrassing for the profession sure, that for who we are. I yeah. had dedicated my life to. Right? It's like, you know, I'm a good writer, but I ain't the best one to the point where I would be the only one, <laughs> you know? And right. so it just said a lot about where we were as an industry, how much further that we still had to go. And it's, it's still 
kind of shameful because I don't think it's much better now than it was, you know, then. I mean, ESPN.com probably has one of the most, if not the most diverse sports writing staffs. But I would venture to say there's probably not a Black female sports columnist at a, de- at a daily newspaper right now in the country. I hope I'm wrong, but not one that I can think of. Just, just some stats. In the U- women of color in the United States make up just 8% of print newsroom staff in general, and 12% of local TV news staff, and 6% of local radio staff. So uh, the fact that it's underrepresented in sports is really no... It's, dramatically, it's, it's a dramatic statement, but not so different from just journalism, new newspaper business and the local TV and local radio business itself. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, in, in, in just in sports journalism, sports media, I mean, more than 85% of the jobs are held by white men. And um, while I know that it is not necessarily a traditional space or considered a traditional space for women, you know, there is a message that has been consistently sent throughout my career, um, just by these numbers and just by what you see, uh, that this is not a space where we belong. And what people need to understand about why this is bad, and it's bad for not just sports journalism, but bad for media in general, is because so much of how uh, stories are shaped are based off these journalists. And you can't Mm -hmm. shape the stories and shape the context for a diverse society if you don't have one in your own newsroom. Um, And what is kind of clear is that journalism is becoming an increasingly elitist profession. And I know that sounds really weird because, at least it sounds weird for me because this uh, that's was- That's counterintuitive. Always- to, to me, it's actually quite the opposite because of social media and because of the plethora of ridiculous you know, websites, blogs, that it's anything but elitist today. It should be elitist. But uh, when I say elitist, I don't mean elitist in terms of color or whatever, just in terms of brain power. It, it's the opposite to me. But it's interesting, you, when you use the word elitist, what did you mean by elitist? Okay, what I meant by that is this, is that you have a lot of, like magazines, let's just take those for example. Right. Most of them have unpaid internships, right? If you're having an unpaid internship, and we know that to be a writer, that the only way you can get experience is by actually writing, right? Because uh, as a friend of mine said years ago, journalism is actually a trade, not necessarily an academic pursuit, because this mm-hmm. is, to, to be good at it, you have to actually do it. Well, Unpaid internships, how many people can afford to live in New York on an unpaid internship? And so that's what I mean by this, is that there's a, there's a, and not just with magazines, um, uh, but also with newspapers as well, is that when I graduated from college, the average salary for a journalist was $19,000 a year. How many people can afford to go to college knowing at the end of that rainbow is $19,000 a year? And that's not including maybe a two... $250,000 $250,000 in debt. I mean, so that, exactly. let's, let's put that in, into the source also. Yeah. Exactly. So it is, um, and and I think that has a, a at least an impact or at least is a factor into why major journalistic institutions remain so white is because you have to be able to weather being poor yeah. or being, you know, essentially working class in order to do this job. Now, I know that everybody looks at me, they look at you, and they look at other people who are on television and think that journalism is actually the opposite of what you said. But these are, you know, this is, that is an anomaly. I mean, what most journalists wind up doing in their career is not winding, is not being on CNN, is not being at ESPN. It is a working class profession. And my fear and my concern is that because of what you need to be able to financially weather to stay a journalist that automatically becomes a major roadblock for mm-hmm. people of color, for Black people in particular. I want to get into a, a bunch of your, your co- columns, columns, or articles that you've written for Atlantic because you, you take on, obviously, the subjects of the day. A couple of columns recently, no surprise on the state of the NFL and, and the fact that there's 15 or 17, 18 years after the Rooney Rule, there's one Black head coach in the NFL, and there were three at the time. And explain to me, I don't want to say why that is, because I know why that is. Explain to me how that can be. Let's put it that way, okay? How, <laughs> how can that be in this, in this day and age? And Roger Goodell is a smart marketing guy, smart business guy. The NFL knows that it's not good for business to have that, to have that stain. So how does this exist right now? Well, one, I think, people need to understand the structure of how the NFL works. Roger Goodell is a figurehead. He is not an NFL owner. So he has virtually no impact on 
who the owners hire and who they don't hire. I mean, certainly as a league, you know, he needs to be, he's going to be the face of this issue. But notice they are not dragging Robert Kraft or any of these other owners out to address why they have, you know, there's still seven NFL teams, I believe, that have never had a Black head coach. So they're not the ones that are taking the brunt of the criticism Roger Goodell is, but Roger Goodell has no impact on the hiring. I mean, he is the league commissioner. So there's that part of it. So you have 32 NFL owners who, um, while this was not, you know, I don't think this is something uh, where they all sat in a room and said, we're not just going to hire Black people, but they're used to and accustomed to operating their teams in a certain way. And it is difficult to convince 32 different people, most of which come from uh, an enormous amount of money because these teams are not their sole source of income. Usually they're a toy, okay? And so it's hard to convince them or get them to understand that they keep following the same hiring patterns. They're comfortable with white men being in charge of their teams. I mean, I think the numbers pretty much bear that out. And I think what I wrote in The Atlantic was they have comfort with Black men as labor, just not as leaders. And so that's how we get to this point where a league, despite having, um, you know, despite Black players making up nearly 70% of the NFL, which means there's an automatic sort of hiring pool that's already there if you played. Although, as we have seen by coaching hires throughout the league, you don't afford, that might be uh, the qualification you need to be a Black head coach because most Black head coaches have actually played in the NFL. The white coaches aren't held to the same standard. They don't, I mean, a lot of them, or some of them, never even play college ball. And so it's like you have this situation of, the goalposts continually moving when it comes to Black coaches and to the point where I think something like this, Brian Flores suing the NFL needed to happen. The NFL ownership needed to be embarrassed. And um, I hope that other NFL coaches join his lawsuit or Black NFL coaches, whether they are a head coach or not. (laughs) I mean, I hope Mike Tomlin joins Brian Flores is on his staff. I hope he joins this lawsuit. I I hope every Black coach that has come through that league joins it, because I think this is the only way that we'll see the kind of systemic change. Keep in mind, the whole reason the Rooney Rule exists is because threat of litigation. Johnny Cochran was going to sue the NFL for this same reason. And as a compromise, the NFL came up with the Rooney Rule. I want to talk to you about fresh food. It's hard to find pre-cooked meals that aren't frozen or tasteless or highly processed. But, you know, we can all benefit by taking the stress out of cooking, yet we want meals that that taste fresh. No one wants to spend an hour cooking dinner after a day at work. Uh, Whether it's for you, your whole family, freshly gives you convenience, flavor, and nutrition. Um, So once again, if 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 you're in the pinch and you don't have the time to cook, but you want fresh stuff, and, you, you, and most of the stuff you're used to that's frozen, tasteless, or highly processed, this is freshly pre-prepared. You get delicious, fresh, healthy meals. Chef-made, nutrient-packed meals delivered straight to your door. No cooking required. Fresh and never frozen, ready to heat and enjoy in just three minutes. Use the Freshly website or app to find meals that fit your lifestyle with plans that work for your dietary needs, preferences, tastes, and family size. Choose from about 50 nutritionist design entries and like their clip. This is great stuff. Classic state peppercorn, multi-serve size like their masterful mac and cheese or the new line of plant-based meals. So simply said, you don't have time to cook. You want fresh food. It's delivered to your house. You make it in three minutes. You got tons of stuff to choose from. This is great. It's affordable and convenient. Skip the grocery store. Skip the dirty dishes. Stop stressing about dinner right now. Freshly is offering our listeners 125 bucks off. That's a lot. 125 bucks off your first five orders when you go to freshly.com slash Donnie. That's 125 bucks off at freshly.com slash Donnie. Take it from me. Check it out. Explain to me your premise, and I'm not challenging it, that the the 32 NFL owners uh, who are uh, white um, have an issue with having men in color in power and they see them as laborers. You have the same type of owner in the NBA, white guys for the most part, with the exception of... uh, Michael, is there any, any other black owners besides Michael Jordan? I think Michael, Michael, Jordan's the, Michael Jordan's the only one. Okay. But you have ostensibly, you know, every owner who's white, it's a toy. So why is that same equation not exist there? Well, one, I think um, NFL players or NBA players, excuse me, have far more power. They have a lot of individual mm-hmm. power. They have a lot of collective power. Their contracts are all yeah. guaranteed. Good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
You know, you look at somebody like LeBron James, uh, I jokingly call him the, the commissioner of the NBA, all right? Uh, right, because of the type of power he can wield. I mean, you have sure, an individual player that can, uh, you know, you look at the what happened to downtown Cleveland after LeBron left. That's from one player. So they're able to wield a lot more power. Um, the other thing, too, I, I think they have um, a much more progressive um, league, just in general, you have yes, younger ownership in general, groups. Overall, vibe of the league. Overall, yeah. yes. Yeah. You have younger ownership groups. Um, certainly there's, you know, black coaches and that's like no kind of novelty in the in the NBA um, or even uh, black people in the front office, no kind of novelty in the NBA. The NFL, you know, by example or by comparison, they got their first black team president two years ago. A hundred years of football happened. And they're just now getting their first black team president uh, who's with the Washington uh, commanders. They've never had a majority black owner. Yeah, a real, and, a real, progressive, organi- real progressive organization. Yeah, one, the one in a hundred years. It's like, what? So, <laughs> but, but it's ironic I, that it's Dan Snyder. I mean, I, you know, right. we, we know his history. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. given all the trouble and all the, yeah. um, all the concerns uh, with him as, a, as an owner. It's a very exclusive club. And the, the NFL operates from that mentality as an exclusive club. And we had the same conversation. Remember when black quarterbacks weren't a thing? It was the same yes. conversation. Doug Williams, the they can't wait, can't win a Super When Doug Williams won a Super Bowl, it was like a, a big deal. Like That was a yeah. story. That was incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, he was the first uh, black quarterback to win one. But before Doug won one, the reason why you didn't see as many black quarterbacks as you see now is because there was a prevalent mentality that black, Men could not lead teams. They couldn't be faces of. I franchise. still think that's there. I, if you look at if you I look do. at the, the drafting, and you look at some of the guys that have made the Mahomes. Okay, there were three quarterbacks taken before him, and if you look at Deshaun Watson, if you, it's still they end up coming from like being a little bit of an underdog. They weren't. It's still the classic six foot four white guy, pocket passer. You know, it, it's just this. This I still think that's out there. I really. I mean, we're coming a long way, but I still think that exists. Yeah, I mean, we haven't totally distanced ourselves from that. From that, I would totally agree. I mean, you look at the criticisms of Lamar Jackson. I mean, they tried to get him to switch positions. I mean, like that still happens yeah. a lot. Is that like Michael Vick? Same thing. Try to get him to to switch, you know, positions. And so, um, it's the same mentality. It's just in the C suite, right? The same mentality is like, oh, can a black man really be trusted? to run an NFL team, uh, trusted to make certain personnel decisions, trusted to lead men, a, a phrase they like to use all the time. And Black quarterbacks literally went through the same discriminatory hurdles as Black coaches are. As a white, a double older white guy, I've seen, particularly since Black Lives Matter, and, and particularly uh, since this, some of the things we've had to endure and watch on television, the, the, uh, the, the execution of a Black man, I've seen dramatic changes in the way businesses approach things and the way TV networks approach things is that it, I'm, my old agency is part of a public company and the director, it is so much front and center now. In other words, it is, uh, I, I mean, MSNBC put out a memo that they were only going to hire people on the air, 50% uh, women, 50% people of color. It is a, I see, and once again, this is white guy's eyes, okay? So you might say, Donnie, that's great, but no, I see in the last year and a half more strides than we've made in my, in, like in the last 20, 30 years. Am I living in a little bit of a fantasy land? What I would say is it's inconsistent. I do think that there are definitely some companies, some organizations, at least in terms of thought process, who are really trying to be intentional about what they do. So I do think that that is like, you're not totally off base. But at the same time, much like we've seen throughout history, Progressive steps are often met with equally fierce backlash. And Mm -hmm. as you say that, we're looking at a number of states, a number of schools who are passing laws banning critical race theory as if that was ever taught in high school, who are specifically attacking works of fiction and nonfiction by Black authors. Because when you look at those lists of banned books, 70, 80% 70, 80% of them are by black folks, okay? Yeah. And so, at let's the throw, same let's throw time, some Jews in there. Let's throw some Jews in yes. there also. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's Jewish writers, it's, 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 it's queer it's writers. I mean, we know yeah. the marginalized uh, communities that they're trying to attack. Yeah. And 
every time I see one of these stories or even something else that happens, and I'm just like, I could have sworn two years ago that y'all said that y'all were ready to have this conversation, and now all of a sudden you're not. So in policy, I have not seen that same level of intentionality. I do appreciate the fact that you do have networks that are taking, um, I don't even want to say taking more chances, it's not that, but are finally respecting or uh, having seeming to be putting forth a greater effort to put Black creatives in a position of, of empowerment. But there's part of me that wonders, is it, are they doing that? Um, are they doing that because it's the right thing to do? Or is some of it also because I think Black creatives such as Issa Rae, who literally did something that hadn't been done before, that they're just deciding that we don't really need your permission to do anything. I mean, with social media now, I mean, she rose to HBO's, um, uh, she came to their radar because of a YouTube show. So I think now Mm. there's so many different ways that Black creatives can exist without the power structure. And so part of me wonders if it's a little bit of that. But to answer your overall question, uh, I do see some progress, but I also see some areas where it's just like, wow, we're really here now, like thinking about the conversations that are being had around the um, Black woman who's now the Supreme Court nominee from Joe Biden, how that immediately became a conversation about yeah. qualifications when nobody was having that about Amy Barry, uh, Amy Barry Coney and she, or her Sandra resume, Day O'Connor. Yeah, or, it, was, yeah, it was a Republican. Her, it, wasn't, yeah, yeah. it wasn't had at all. And most, uh, considering the fact that she's the first and only one out of what, over 100 white guys who have been on the Supreme Court. It's just funny to me how suddenly that conversation has now shifted to, is she qualified when her resume looks better than the last woman who is now a Supreme Court justice? So when I see things like that, then I get a little bit more discouraged. And I I can realize idiots are always going to have, they're going to be louder than sometimes the silent (laughs) approving majority but I guess on it, I guess I'm day to day with whether or not there was actually some progress made um, from 2020. Jamel, this show is all about brands, and the, the whole premise is, is that everybody and everything is a brand, and every every institution, every politician, every person. And your brand is very much one about controversy, going back to your days at ESPN. And you you're, you're probably you're, you're the the most press that ever was around. You was around, of course. Uh, you, you you ESPN was dr- drifting into politics. And you one day correctly said that Donald Trump is a white supremacist, and I would stand by you, stand next to you, and say that uh, with a megaphone. And that led to uh, you leaving and led to ESPN making a decision that we're not in the sport, which is so ironic because today, sports, entertainment, politics, it's one and the same, you know, and, and, and it's almost, and because they do have a younger audience, I was, I was kind of surprised at their stance of we're not drifting into that world because the world has drifted there whether they like it or not. Uh, that last part is very true. Although I would say this is- um, You've since you written know, an apology. Those- in, in, you, you've since, I well, want to bring, you, you or, or that you, were not an apology, that you regretted, yeah. you regretted saying it, right? Uh, let me correct you. No, that. I never apology. said that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't regret right. that. I don't regret <laughs> yeah. saying it. What I, I do I thought apologize. there was. Uh, I th- well, I thought there this was is what a, you're. Re- this is what you're referring what am I referring to. to? You're, referring, you're referring to a column that I wrote um, while I was still at ESPN. What I didn't enjoy about that experience, and what I was sorry for, is the position that I put my colleagues in and ESPN in. Okay. I didn't. I I was never taken back what I said. Like that was right. clear from the beginning, and I told them that. Yeah. Like I'm not apologizing to Donald Trump. I'm not. Ap- no, that's not going to happen. I've Fuck never no. put out a statement. <laughs> Yeah, saying that. I would have turned such. off ESPN, right? <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that. But here's what I'll address something that you said. You know, at the time when that was happening, this is 2017, it's obviously a very highly charged political time in our country um, because of the election of Trump. And you also had, you know, athletes being very vocal about their dislike of Trump, you know, something mm-hmm. that was celebrated regardless of political party. Athletes simply attending the White House you know, after winning a championship used to be nonpartisan, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But now all of a sudden, you know, nobody wanted to go and they were very vocal about the reasons why, very understandable, justified reasons. And so as you, to your point, sports was being dragged into politics, whether they like it or not. 
Now, ESPN was in a particular moment because they were being accused of being political. When the truth was, Donnie, ESPN has never been political. They never have. And people took certain things and they used their bully pulpit to try to make it seem like ESPN was getting too liberal, they're getting too political. And when you really think about it, it wasn't that. It was the fact that the faces of the network were changing and some people resented that. I had my own mm-hmm. show. My co-host was Black, Michael Smith. You had more mm-hmm. women who were driving shows. I mean, with you, their had the, you had the 6 p.m. spot. You had the, the yeah. prime spot. I mean, you know. Exactly. You know. So you have that, you know, you have a a black woman every night coming to you at six o'clock. You have Stephen A. Smith, who emerged as, I think, the face of ESPN. You have Dan Levitard, you have Bomani Jones. You have all these different, Mm -hmm. Sarah Spain, Kate Fagan, all these different faces who are bringing different perspective about the world of sports. We were not on ESPN at any moment talking about immigration reform. We were not talking about healthcare reform. We weren't talking about Medicare for all. We were talking about sports. And this idea that started to gain momentum that ESPN was political was all a bad faith argument created by people who didn't like certain things. They didn't like how the network was changing. They didn't like the fact that Caitlyn Jenner received the Arthur Ashe Award and which made perfect sense because she was so vocal about the suicide rate that transgender youth were facing in this country, which is still a significant problem. They saw things like that and they turned it into ESPN as being political because they didn't like some of the values that were starting to come forward, um, you know, via programming and having different people like me on talking about sports. So that was always, to me, um, uh, a bad perception that ESPN got wrapped up in. When I made those comments about Donald Trump, I did not make them on the Six O'Clock Sports Center. I did not make them on e- any ESPN show. I made them on Twitter. Oh, and Trump. I understand why they blew up. Um, but it was just funny to me how like literally, uh, you know, a year or so later in the presidential debates, like people calling Donald Trump a white supremacist was like saying water is wet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was making Hitler comparisons with Donald Trump. And I, I think it's one of the things that got my show off the air on MSNBC, and they thought it was too extreme. And, and this was two, two years before he, before he got voted out. I said, if he doesn't win, he's going to tell people to take to the streets. I mean, everything is true. And now it's just matter of fact stuff. It's just, it's kind of kind of a given. And uh, it's, uh, but but you're, um, you're, you are a hero and, and, I, and I love that you kind of stand by your convictions and you don't back down and it makes make you who you are. I want to talk about um, the doc that you're working on with Spike that you're producing uh, on Colin Kaepernick. If I was an owner and I said to you, because there's no doubting his credentials, but what if Bob Kraft, I don't want to name a name, fill in the owner said to you, well, the reason I didn't want to bring Ka- Kaepernick in is because I'm running a business and it would automatically make, he would become, not because of my choice, not because of, I, I believe in him. And I mean, every piece of media coverage about my football team and every discussion in the fans would be centered on this issue, this issue of race. And I don't want it to be about race. I mean, the very thing that kept it, we would say, I don't want it to be about race. And like it or not, it's not fair if I bring him in, this is creating a centerpiece of my team that's going to be about this. So don't, don't shoot the player, you know? I mean, don't, I mean, don't fault me, the owner. I'm just trying to do what's best for my enterprise. And I think bringing that in is going to be a distraction. What's the response to that? A couple of responses. Then, uh, you know, if you think that way, then you're not making football decisions. The reason the business becomes successful is when you have the best players on the team. And what you're saying is that you can't make a football decision. Because if this is about him being a good player, him being able to contribute to your football team, that's what it should be about. The other thing I would say is that it's funny that those conversations seem to not really take place about somebody being a distraction, the type of media coverage that they'll bring to your team. And not that Colin did anything that was remotely close to this, but just using as an analogy, did Jerry Jones uh, went out and signed Greg Hardy. Greg Hardy, who tried to kill a woman. Domestic abuser, yeah. Exactly. And did he have a conversation about what kind of media attention this would bring his football team? Probably not. Did he care about the negative press about his football team? No. And it's something that I've said many times before. 
is that if Colin Kaepernick hit a woman, he'd be playing in the NFL right now. If that was his, you know, if that was um, his yeah. crime, so to speak, uh, he'd be playing. And that, so that's why that whole argument about, oh, he'd be a distraction, he'd be this, he'd be that. Uh, okay, there might be some increased media coverage. I mean, the uh, the Raiders, they have a, uh, a a gay football player that's on their team. Is that a distraction? How much is written about that and talked about that? Right. Like, right. not a lot, right. right? Okay, it's like, there's a yeah. wave of it, sure. People be intrigued, sure. But y'all seem to make really interesting decisions, and and I would not put the gay f- football player in this category, but they make really dicey decisions all the time and don't care about media coverage. So the bottom line is this. The reason why Colin Kaepernick isn't playing is not because he's not good enough. It's not because he can't play anymore. It's not because he doesn't want to play anymore. He very much wants to play football still. Something was taken from him the professional career that he worked for his whole life. The reason he's not playing is because the NFL owners decided that they were going to keep him out of the league because I think they're still very much vengeful about the uh, about how Donald Trump was using um, Colin Kaepernick as a political talking point. And they blame him for a lot of the ne- negative press that the league received, the fact that they were caught up in this political firestorm that they didn't want to be caught in. And they also really don't like it when players are empowered. Mm -hmm. The other problem that an NFL owner would face by having Colin Kaepernick in your locker room is that you actually have somebody who is so revered by so many other players and they look at his stance and are inspired by it, that they're not going to follow the coach or the owner. They're going to follow him. It's the rub off effect that also scares. But is that? But if I'm but if I'm running a team, if I'm running a team, that's if I'm a coach, I don't want that. I don't want that whether whether he's black or white. I I don't want my team following, revering somebody that they're following. I don't say more than me. That that's a that I would see that as a problem, black, white, or 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 any color. Well, the thing is, it's not a problem if they're doing it in a way that they feel like is beneficial to them. Like they they will talk right. about somebody's leadership traits all day long, right? What they don't yeah. want players to do is it's not necessarily about speaking up about injustice. That's one part of it. They don't want the empowerment light to turn on and say, hey, wait a minute. Maybe we should be concerned about this race norming issue in the NFL. Maybe we should start demanding that there are more black NFL head coaches and there are more black GMs and black team presidents because they're going to start asking questions and demanding things that the owners don't want to give them. And so it is, to me, a very interesting peek into the mindset of the NFL machine. It's cowardly as hell because mm. you want strong people. You want strong, good, talented people Leaders, within yeah. your organization. Yeah. Um, and the fact that this has, that somebody's career has been taken away from them in real time they were sending a message to other players as well. If you dare try to do something like he did, if you dare, in our minds, get out of your place, then this is what will happen to you. And I always thought it was a really big miscalculation by the other NFL players when they didn't follow Colin. I don't think that they were, they understood the type of message they were sending about what they were willing to stand for. It was more players upset about COVID restrictions than about the fact that a man had been blackballed for simply wanting justice, for simply wanting to bring Mm -hmm. awareness to social injustice and systemic oppression. That's the hill they chose to die on, was the COVID hill, but not that one. Very interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, You mentioned LeBron James earlier, and and I'm in awe of him and and, and how he's using his platform and the things that he's accomplishing. I mean, I think he could run for president someday. And we contrast that with Michael Jordan who, you know, lives in a stratosphere unlike any other athlete, certainly in my lifetime, other than maybe Muhammad Ali. And Michael has always steered clear. And do you think he's kind of, he's missed his obligation that, that at this point, I mean, we go back to the old Charles Barkley, Nike commercial, you know, I'm not, I'm not your role model. Bullshit, you are. Uh, and so I'm curious your take on Michael Jordan, who still years later is fairly the opposite of outspoken when it comes to issues issues of the day? I, I think that every athlete who decides to, um, that they want to use their platform and leverage it uh, for bigger causes, be it racial injustice, oppression, whatever it may be, that you have to do it in a way 
that that is comfortable for you. Because everybody isn't meant to be a Colin Kaepernick and everybody isn't meant to be a LeBron James. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as frustrating as it was in certain moments in his career, moments where he didn't really have anything to lose. And of course, everybody goes back to when Strom Thurmond was uh, running for Senate in North Carolina. And Strom Thurmond, notorious racist, like everybody knows what this dude, right? Like saying that Strom... Exactly. Coming out against Strom Thurmond Mm -hmm. is not exactly what I would consider to be... Putting it on the line, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. you're not putting it on the line because we know what he is. And so for during that time, for Michael Jordan to be hesitant about whether to come out uh, in support of his opponent at the time, Harvey Gantt, it was a missed opportunity. And I think it was a bad moment. That being said, I don't think that Michael Jordan ever felt comfortable being a voice. But what he does feel comfortable with, and we see this now in this part um, of his life, is he has donated a lot of money to social justice causes. A lot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for him, so even the act- yeah, I mean, he and there's some athletes who do that. And I think that's fine, because what I don't want is to see the athletes who are not as well versed on the issues, who don't have a comprehensive understanding of what's going yeah. on, start talking and undermining the cause. So I, I, I'm OK with checkbook um, uh, social uh, justice support. I'm more than OK with that. But I do think LeBron and Colin Kaepernick both, because they're of the same generation, they have provided a different blueprint for Black athletes that shows that you don't have to be silent anymore. And so I think we're seeing a lot of athletes exercise a level of agency that we haven't seen before. It's not always about a cause, but even how they operate their own lives. I mean, looking at Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles, them making this decision not to compete, choosing Mm -hmm. their mental health, putting themselves first is something that um, I think is very empowering for today's athletes. And they're drafting this a little bit from the sort of athlete leaders of, of their generation. Tell me about, I'm going to switch just a little, little bit. I want to talk about some things coming up for you. Tell me about the new uh, CNN streaming show with you, buddy. When is this going to happen? I know I, I read it's the intersection of pop culture and politics and blah, blah, you know, whatever <laughs> a, a network, whatever network would put out. I want to hear from you. What's, what's the new show about? All right, new show coming out on CNN Plus, the streaming service. Um, and it's me and Carrie Champion, another former ESPN anchor. Her and I also did a show together on Vice um, last yes. year. And so uh, Carrie and I have great chemistry on air. And, you know, we're really good friends, really tight. And so we're just bringing uh, more of our shenanigans to television. And so, of course, we'll discuss uh, a gamut of things from politics to sports to pop culture, Um a myriad of things, but we also have some different wrinkles in this show where you're going to see Carrie and I outside a little more. So we wanted to get out of studio, add some different wrinkles to the show. So I think um, people will enjoy it. It's a, it's, it's. Uh, I think the uh, uh, Carrie, she kind of surmised it the perfect way. Uh, we're giving you candy and broccoli. <laughs> okay, that's what the show is. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, like candy that. and broccoli. All right, it's before, called, before it's I let you go, it's easy, by the way. And what is it? What, do we know? Do we have a date? Do we have a debut date? Um, so we're looking at, um, let's just say late spring. It'll be in the spring. Okay. Mm-hmm. I can't wait. I can't wait. Uh, before I let you go, uh, I asked the same question of everybody. Um, Jamel Hill, tell me what the Jamel Hill brand is. <laughs> you know, it's so ironic because when I first um, got the notice that you wanted me to have a guest on the show, and I know you do talk a lot about branding, marketing, you know, probably the word that I hate most is brand. <laughs> yeah. And that's only because I have so many young people. It's the whole fucking journalists. premise of my show, you know? I know, I know. But I mean, you attack. <laughs> you're not you, the first you, one to say that. You're not the first one. I know, and, 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 and it's not, it's not, of course, it's not based off anything you said. It's based off the fact that you have, you know, young people who constantly ask me, like, how do I build my brand? How do I build my brand? And they're journalists. And I'm like, the work is the brand. That is what it is. It's not, you know, you you can't sit there and um like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post this. It was funny earlier when you said that my brand was controversy because I'm like, that's that's what people associate me with. That's the perception, is that I'm controversial. But for all intents and purposes of your question, my brand is authenticity. That's what it is. My brand is being genuine. I am just me, and that's it. And me is enough 
in my opinion. Uh, I don't wake up every day thinking about the most controversial thing I could say, thinking about who I'm going to piss off. I don't think about any of that. I always operate from a place of realness because that's all I know how to be. I hear you. Well, the podcast is unbothered. We've got a new CNN Plus show coming up that I can't wait to see. Can't wait. When is the documentary? Do we have a date, a release date for the documentary on? on we do on not, Kaepernick? but we're already um, we're already filming, and just based off like what's been filmed so far, this is this is going to be very special, extremely special. Good for you, man. Keep up the good mm-hmm. fight. All right, Jamel. Really appreciate right. your time. Thank you, Danny. You stay well. Hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, I love her. I think she's fantastic. And I want to see you next time on On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. And once again, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you get podcasts on Apple, Spotify, anywhere. Please rate and review and subscribe. Or you can watch our videos on YouTube and please subscribe. And also we want to hear your comments there. Have a safe week. We'll see you next time on On Brand. Everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.